Amen. I do. Uh, can you hear me there? I do appreciate the fact that I had a dad that that loved Jesus. Amen. And I'm grateful that we don't have to uh, sacrifice animals every year. We can look back at Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice for us. Walking on the road to Jerusalem. Time had come to sacrifice again. My two small sons walked beside me on the road. The reason that they came was to watch the Lamb. Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much we don't understand. So I told them about Moses and Father Abraham. And then I said, dear children, watch the Lamb. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure the Lamb doesn't run away. And then I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And then I said, dear children, watch the Lamb. When we reach the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. And then I heard the crowd cry out, Crucify him. We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not wish to play. Why upon this day were men condemned to die? Why were we standing here where soon they would pass by? I looked and said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy. The people gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I still can hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. Then someone said, there's Jesus. I scarce believe my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow. Running down the cross and falling to the ground, I watched him as he struggled. I watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss. Then a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, carry his cross. At first to try to resist him, but his hand reached for his sword. So I knelt and took the cross from the Lord. I placed it on my shoulder, started down the street. The blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek. They let us to Golgotha, they drove nails deep in his feet and hands. 
Yet upon the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other's eyes. To thy hands I commit my spirit, he prayed, and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years, I'd lost all sense of time. But then I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us, but our lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much we don't understand. I took him in my arms, turned and faced the cross. Then I said, dear children, watch the Lamb. Uh, Amen. Amen. Pastor Clay, thank you for that. Let's all stand together. Praise the Lord. We would all do well today to keep our eyes on the Lamb of God. The great Savior died on the cross so that we might be saved today. We're grateful that you're here on this Father's Day. I also wanted to mention that um, our brother here, Jolly Peterman, your mother passed away this week, brother, and we're praying for your family as well to lift you guys up to the Lord. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 18 with me. And um, inasmuch as this is Father's Day, I want to share what might be described as a Father's Day message. Now, on Mother's Day, all of you men were really giving me the amens and uh, that's right, preacher, you tell them. Um, but you did not have on your mind that Father's Day was just around the corner, and so you ladies today will be able to uh, say amen, and preacher, you tell those men like it is, uh, because that's what the Word of God does, and that's what we're going to share this morning. Now, in Genesis chapter 18, there's one verse I want to read to you. If you've been here very long, you know that this is one of my favorite Father's Day verses. The Bible says in Genesis 18, 19, speaking of course of Abraham, the Bible says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that, he, uh, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So what we see there is, I believe, a great compliment from God concerning Abraham stating, I know that man. And that man will lead his family, those that he has influence over, he will, will lead them in the ways of the Lord and teach them to obey the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Now, I'm going to take you to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. Uh, you might turn over there. You're going to be sitting for just a bit. And so uh, go ahead and kind of stretch your legs while you're up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. And uh, we will look there at verse number 1 and following. Now, this is the passage of Scripture where David is old and... Um, maybe viewing death as not so far away. And he says in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 1, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, 
Now, I want all of you men to listen very carefully to what David said to Solomon. You young men that are not yet married, but you hope one day to be married, this is something that you need to pay close attention to as David, this man of God, gave a last instruction to his son Solomon. And this is what he said. I go the way of all the earth. Therefore, what he was saying is, I'm going to die, Solomon. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies. And it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. On this Father's Day, I want to preach a message that I would entitle, Just Short. Just Short. Now, before I let you sit down, I want you to go to Genesis, once again, to chapter 31. And I promise right after this, I'm going to let you sit down. Genesis chapter 31. And I want to read there just a couple of verses. The Bible says, And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and, do, uh, and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. Now, the Lord will tie this together for us as we travel through the message this morning. Father, we are grateful and we love you. Thank you for the joy of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity we have to serve a great and living God. Pray, Father, that you would give comfort to the Pierce family this morning, that you would give comfort to the Peterman family as well. And, Lord, help us to look forward to the day that we'll all be reunited in that glorious, wonderful place that you've prepared for us in heaven. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. I wanted to just say to Clay, I appreciate him doing that song. That's one of my very favorites because there's a message in that song, and then I wanted to take a moment to um, read something that my daughter wrote to me a long time ago. She called me this morning. She and her family are traveling. They're in Chicago today, and uh, she called me this morning to say Happy Father's Day, and I was grateful for that, and it reminded me of a card that she wrote to me when she was just a little girl. Some of you may remember many years ago, that there was an event that happened here in our area, and I don't know about other counties, but I know that it, it hit McIntosh and Muskogee County, and there were these black worms, they called them army worms, and they literally attacked the land. They were everywhere. They were so thick, it was absolutely nasty, Local television stations from Tulsa actually came down and did some stories on it because it was such an odd thing that happened. But these worms would literally get to a particular piece of property, and as they came across it, and they were rather rapid as they came across, and when they got to the other side, all the grass was gone, and it just looked like bare, it was just bare ground. That was all that was left. That was a number of years ago. We, had a, we have a place over in Muskogee County, and we had 160 acres of wheat planted over there. And uh, so my prayer was, I hope those worms don't get to our wheat. Uh, but they did, and uh, they got to that wheat field and the neighbor's wheat fields as well. But when they got to our wheat field, it was literally just like you strung a string across it and came right across all the way down to where it joined the highway, and the wheat crop was completely gone. It was just bare grass. And I was disturbed about that. 
uh, most of us get a little disturbed when things hit us in the pocketbook, and I was a little disturbed about those worms eating the grass. So my daughter wrote me a card. How many of you have ever been set straight in a loving, kind way by the words of your children? She says, Dad. She started out by saying, I love you. She wanted to set the stage. She said, I just uh, <clears throat> wanted to tell you that I love you, and you're the best dad in the world. I wanted to make sure to reiterate that. Did you get that? She said, you're the best dad in the world. But she said, you've always been there for me, and I'm grateful that you never gave up on me, even though it may have been easier to do so. I know that you are <clears throat> discouraged about those ugly worms eating our grass. I was enjoying my Bible study this morning, and I was looking at the names of God, and there are three names that might encourage you. Does that sound like a preacher's daughter? I mean, she is letting me have it. I guess I'd been walking around with a long face feeling sorry for myself because those worms were eating the grass. So she goes on, and she uses the name of God, Elohim, the Creator. And she writes, God created the grass, Dad, but he also created the worms. So somehow, he will use this. Unfortunately, you just can't see how just now. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. <clears throat> he holds us in the palm of his hands, and he is sufficient for all of our needs, Dad, even the grass for our cows. Jehovah Jireh, <clears throat> the Lord, will provide. Praise the Lord, he has always provided for us. She said, I love you, Dad, but I want you to know that you need to keep your chin up because God created everything, even those ugly army worms. I've kept that as a reminder that things may not look, things may not seem the way we would like for them to be, but we yet serve a God who owns everything. We serve a God who is all-sufficient. We serve the Creator God who has promised us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And I thank God for um, children that can help keep dad in line. Now I want to speak to you men today, and I have entitled the message Just Short, a Father's Day message. I hope that you are aware and have not had your head buried in the sand to where you do not realize that America is in need of some men. America is in need of some men who will stand as David commanded Solomon to stand and just be a man. And inasmuch as that is a problem in America, it has also become a problem in our churches. We need churches that are inhabited by men who are able, by the grace of God, and willing, by the grace of God, to stand and be what God has called us to be. There's something going on in our world today, and again, I see it even in our churches around the country, that uh, we've, we're, we're reverting back, if you will, the wrong way. We're going, it seems like... Uh, uh, very rapidly away from the commandments and the testimonies and the statutes of God. I've noticed that uh, maybe in uh, news interviews and things like that where there's a man and his wife being interviewed, and I would encourage you to pay attention to this because it's not just something funny, it is so very real, that the questions that are asked are almost always directed to the wife, and the wife is the one that answers, and the husband sits there as if he is glad that he got invited to the interview, uh, but you're not going to say anything. Now, you might say, well, you're just being picky um, at things like that. No, I'm not. I am being observant to a, uh, a situation that's going on in our nation, and even in our churches. You know, I speak to young pastors all the time, and many young pastors, and I would say probably the majority of those that I speak to, say that there are just simply no men in their churches. There's, 
there's women, uh, there's children, but the men are just not present. They stay at home. They do other things on the Lord's Day. And even if they are there, they are somewhat non-participants in the worship time. They just seem to be present. God wants us to be men. Now, I pray that there's no one in our congregation today that is confused about your manhood. But since we're live streaming and there'll be some folks listening in, I may not be talking to you, but someone out there. Since this is Father's Day, can we all agree that it still takes a man to be a father? No matter what the culture does, no matter what the Supreme Court of the United States says, no matter what individual governors may sign into law, it still takes a man to be a father. And biblically speaking, it still takes a man to be a husband. Now, I lost some of you on that, and some of you liberals listen to me now. <laughs> the Bible says it takes a man to be a husband. Amen. Oh, I got you then. That's good. I, it doesn't matter what the culture says. It still takes a man to be a husband and a father. Now, some of you are going, uh, ho hopefully you're preaching to somebody way out there because we've all got that down. There was a time when I would say yes. In a, in a good church, surely we all have that down. The sad thing is this. Many churches, because of their weak liber, uh, leadership, have now allowed that, that false lifestyle, if you will, that lie to come right into the churches. And there are literally churches today where people are confused about what it takes to be a man and what it takes to be a woman. Do you all understand that? Say amen. Okay. Now, I'm going to get into the message. That was all free. It didn't cost you a thing. Now, God needs some men that will stand up and be men. I'll give you some illustration as I go. And, you know, I knock on a lot of doors, and I'm in a lot of homes. And it's sad as I go into homes and visit with people that it becomes very obvious that there's this, there's this confusion or there's this compromise over who is the head of the house. There's a compromise over who should be in charge of, of, of teaching and training the children and disciplining the children. There's this confusion about that. And yet there should not be because the Bible is very clear on that issue. I appreciated Brother Cowboy as he taught our Bible study this morning and about the fact that we should never ever compromise not one single word of the Word of God. We should hold fast to that word. But we'll never have the fathers that we need and the husbands that we need if we cave into the world rather than stand on the promises of God. And so, on this Father's Day, dads, let me remind you that you should be a husband before you are a father. Now, we have that out of order in many ways, but you should first be a husband, and then you should be a father. Now, how many of y'all, is that elementary, is, is that, ele but do we understand that? Yeah. Did you know it's just as important for a little boy, a young man, to keep his purity than it is for a young woman to keep her purity? But we don't talk about the boys no, we, it's always the girls. You girls need to keep your purity. You girls need to, need to not make provisions for the flesh. But I want to tell you behind this pulpit, and our Bible teachers and our leadership, we have always taught it is just as important for you young men to protect your purity as it is for the young ladies. And I want to encourage you with that today. You need to be a husband and then you need to be a father and with that comes great responsibilities husbands you have certain callings and responsibilities and i want to touch on those very quickly if i may the bible says in genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24 i'm going to be going fast you don't have to turn there if you'll just make a note of some of these places i will ask you to turn to some that's where the Bible says that a man and woman are to come together and they're to be one flesh, no longer two but one, and that they are to leave their father and mother and cleave only to their wife or to one another. We use a simple term like leave and cleave. You might say, well, what's, uh, what's that all about? 
Well, we cannot serve two masters. And we cannot be loyal, if you will, in a biblical sense when we try to maintain a relationship that was from birth with our parents once we take a wife. And so you young men, I want you to look at me just a minute. I know some of y'all are hiding behind other people, so I can't see your face. But I want to tell you this. Before you take a wife, there are certain things that you need to do. Now, I know this is not something that's preached very often anymore. How many of y'all know that young men, before they take a wife, ought to be able to support his wife? That means you don't expect mom and daddy to pay your bills once you take a wife. Are we okay? I mean, that used to be the way it was. Now listen, before you take a wife, you need to have a place to take your wife. I mean, listen, we've got young people today. Now this is a Father's Day message and some of you guys are going... I mean, I'm not even a father yet, and you're beating me up. Well, listen, before you take a wife, make sure you've got a place to take your wife. Like home, not to mama's house. How many of you all know that even though your mother, you young boys, listen to me. Even though your mother may truly love the woman that you take to be your wife, did you know that when you and your wife have a conflict, your mother is still going to take up for her son? It is a rare situation when some parent has enough spiritual forewithal to look at their son and say, you know what, you are wrong, and your wife is right. Now, you go home and take care of your wife. Most parents won't do that. They'll cave in to their own children, even if they are wrong. I've had parents say, but I can never go against my child. That's why your child is spoiled rotten. Do you know Clay used to tell people when he, we came to Lindsay Chapel? Back then we had stairwells that went up either side, and there were Sunday school classes up there. And uh, I can't imagine it. I, I, just, I can't imagine it, but Clay got caught sliding down the rail of the, of the deal. And, and uh, uh, one of our ladies come to me, and she said, do you know your son's sliding down the deal? And I said, uh, no, I didn't know it, but I'll fix it. He won't slide down it tomorrow. And he may run down it, but he's not going to slide down on his rear because I'm going to fix that. <laughs> and, and, and listen, Clay used to tell people that I had a bounty out on him, <laughs> that I actually paid people to catch him doing things wrong so that I could deal with that. Now, guys, I'm just saying this, that if we're going to have godly men in the future those of you guys that are already men need to start applying biblical principle to your children and your grandchildren now so that we'll have some godly men in the next generation. It's not just going to happen. We have to be intentional. We have to be diligent. We have to have courage to stand up and teach our young men to be men. We get some feedback once in a while because uh, some of our young men learn at early ages uh, and some of you dads that are teaching your kids this I praise God for it we've got some men that are teaching their boys at young ages that they need to be courageous and that they do not need to be afraid of things and that they need to be kind and polite and courteous but yet they are young men and they need to stand up and learn to be men at an early age now, some of you are going, now that's stretching it some. Folks, I want to tell you, if you read the Word of God, you'll find it's not just a story that there were kings at the age of seven and eight years old. Those are not just stories. That is history from the Word of God. And they were raised up by men that loved God, and I'm sure with proper counsel, they were able to maintain those positions. We need to raise up a generation of young men that love the Lord enough to do what he says to do. But we are in a major dilemma in America today. And I might add, I'm giving you a lot of introduction. Pastor Clay and I had a good time on the phone this morning because at about 8.30, the Lord completely changed what I was going to preach. And I was in a little bit of a dilemma, so I called my son and I gave him some scripture and I said, you got to help me with this. 
Now, I'm going to just say this. I'm grateful to God that God has called our son into the ministry. But guys, your children do not have to be in the ministry for you to raise them up in a manner that if you need to, you can even get some counsel from that young man that you raised up to be a godly young man. We have that great opportunity. You see, we need to leave and cleave. Husbands, you need to live joyful with your wife. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse number 9. What does that mean to live joyful with the wife of thy youth? Listen, some of you men, and, and I, I used to say you young men, but I mean it's not limited anymore to young men. Some of you men, uh, when you are with your wife, you act as if we are in the middle of the Great Depression. Now, you might say, what are you talking about? Did you know that there's nothing more exciting as I look out and watch people coming across our parking lot? It blesses my heart to see a couple, I don't care if they've been married two days or 52 years, it doesn't matter. And to see them coming across the parking lot, holding hands with each other and smiling and literally acting like you enjoy your spouse. And boy, I look out my window some Sunday morning. I do. I look out my window. That's why my office is in the front. Some of the men said, you want us to move your office to the back? And I said, not on your life. I want to be able to watch people coming across the parking lot. Some of you men, did you know it, it says something about your character and about how you really feel about your wife when you guys get out of the car in the parking lot and make your way to the front door of the church before you put your pastoral smile on and... Uh, and you act as if, you act as if you are with an, a, a, a stranger or somebody that has just slapped you away from the table. I'm telling you, I've been watching you, Mike. I've been watching you, Lee. I've, I've been watching you, DJ. I can say that to all of you. But do you dwell joyfully with the wife that God has given to you? You might say, well, why is that important? Because there's some little eyes watching you. And there's some little ears listening to you. And they don't only hear what you say, but they see how you walk. And they see your expressions. And your children will grow up and treat their spouses the way you're treating your spouse today. Because much more, much more than what we say with our mouth is caught by our children. And the Bible says to you husbands that you need to live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. And I know some of you are saying, well, do you do that every day? Do you just wake up every morning and you're just so happy to be married to Miss Deb? I didn't say I've got it down. I'm just saying that's the way it ought to be. It ought to be that way. And you ought not to act like when you finish a day's work that you'd rather go somewhere else other than home. We need some men that will live joyfully with the wife that God has given to you. It might make your life a little more pleasant and your wife a little easier to live with. Now... Some of you are going, would you get to the good stuff about Father's Day, like how grateful that the world should be that I'm alive? Well, I may not make it there today. Did you know that you need to love your wife sacrificially? The Bible says, husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church. And what? Gave himself for it. Pastor Clay was singing just a while ago. Aren't you grateful that Jesus Christ died on the cross and gave himself that you might be a child of God? And the Bible says then that you are to love you men. You are to love your wife with a sacrificial love. That means that not only should you love her enough to die for her, need be, but that you should be willing to make sacrifices for her as often as you can. Now, you might say, what do you mean, make sacrifices? That sounds like some kind of an Old Testament term. No, your wife needs to understand that you will literally make sacrifices for her. Miss Deb likes to travel, and I do too. I like to travel from the house to the church, and from the church to the house, 
and to this piece of property to that piece of property right here is closest home as I can be I love to travel but did you know that my, Miss Deb likes to travel other places and I hate it I hate being in motels I hate driving I, people road rage me all the time brother Jerry I get road raged all the time because I'm doing this and Deb's listening to that woman that's telling us which way to go and I thought to myself I didn't got a woman telling me where to go I don't need another one telling me where to go and people are honking at me and I got Miss Deb a new car and that car is a stupid thing if you get too close to this line, the steering wheel shakes. And if you get too close to that line, the steering wheel shakes. And if you get too close to the guy in front of you, the brakes come on. Are y'all following me? If I ever get her a new car, I'm going to get her a 67 Ford. <laughs> I hate traveling, but she likes to travel. So we, but we, I still hadn't made that sacrifice. I'm just telling you that we. You know, sometimes it doesn't hurt to make some little sacrifices. Like, Miss Debbie, you want to plan a trip for us? I'll send Clay. <laughs> I mean, if you want to plan a trip, I'll go. Wherever she lead, I will go. Kicking and screaming. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I'll smile. I love it because she knows I hate it. <laughs> I'm just giving you a simple illustration here. We need men that will love their wives sacrificially, enough to die for them, and enough on a daily basis to show them that you're willing to get out of your comfort zone because you love them. You might say, Preacher, my wife and I have been married a long time. We've got all that worked out. Did you know that many, many divorces today are happening to people that have been married over 30 years? Got it all worked out, right? No. Because it's not something that we get worked out. It's something that we work on as long as we live. Husbands, you need to honor your wife. What do you mean honor your wife? I mean you need to praise your wife. You need to let people know how much you love your wife and how much you care about her and what she does, the sacrifices she makes for you. You need to praise your wife. You need to honor her. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7 that we are to, we are to honor them as the weaker vessel. Now, I know that flies in the face with our culture today, but how many of you all know that it is true that most men are physically stronger than most women. Now, the, I'm telling you, we're live streaming, and I'm sure there's people going, I'm turning that sucker off. I, I, are y'all with me? That Bible says, husbands, you need to honor your wife as the weaker vessel. So it doesn't say as the lesser, it doesn't say as less than, it says as the weaker vessel. Now, I tell some of these young boys, I give good marriage counsel. Miss Deb just kind of grinned at me there, so I'm not going to tell some of the counsel I give to these young boys. You young boys, listen, be careful. Just be careful. Be careful about marrying a woman that gets up, goes to the gym, and works out every day and can, can bench press 350 pounds. <laughs> I mean, just kind of be careful of that. I mean, you may not prevail in the next argument that you have. That had nothing to do with my message. I just thought it was good for you, you boys to pay attention to who you marry up with. God is looking for some men that will be strong men. Now, that was for you husbands. Now let's talk to you fathers. God has a calling on your life, a responsibility. Did you know that you are to teach your, your children? Deuteronomy 6, 7 says we're to teach the word of God to our children and to do it diligently. 
You're to train your children. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Do you know that most people in America today, um, I see some trends going on. I'm not picking on anybody, but how many of you guys own a dog? Hold up your hand. Come on, don't be afraid. I'm not going to pick on you. Okay. Uh, the majority of you raised your hand yes, and the rest of you didn't tell the truth. Uh, and it's okay to, to have it. Did you know that most parents will, treat, teach, will take more time training their dog to be obedient than they will their children? They will. I mentioned I knocked on doors a lot, didn't I? I walked, went to, knocked on the door some time back, and they uh, reluctantly opened the door and let me in. And uh, I went in, the kids is going crazy. I mean, screaming, hollering, yelling, having a fit. Couldn't hardly visit with the parents. We step out on the porch. I was getting ready to leave. I wasn't making any headway there. So I getting ready to leave. And uh, as I got out on the porch, this big old red dog jumps up on the porch. And the man says, get off the porch. I had to make sure he wasn't talking to me. <laughs> he was actually talking to the dog. And he goes, but I would have obeyed. If, I mean, if he wanted me to leave, I'd have left. He goes, get off the porch. And the dog just got right off the porch. And I started down the steps, and the dog was counting away. And he says, get out of the way. The dog got out of the way. And so he followed me out to the vehicle. I said, do you mind if I? I said, do you, do you mind if I just say something to you? He was a young man. He goes, no, go ahead, preacher. And I said, you should spend as much time teaching your children to obey as you have your dog. He looked at me and I said, unless you think the dog is smarter than the children. <laughs> now, some of you are saying, I bet you they never invited you back to their house. They never invited me that time. I just stopped by. <laughs> Now, God is looking for some men that will not only teach but train their children. In other words, open the word of God and teach them, but by your actions, train them. Give them something to follow. That's what God is looking for in fathers today. That's what God demands in fathers today. Fathers, you need to nurture your children. Ephesians 6, 4. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, you need to provide for your children. The Bible says it's right for a parent to lay up things for their children. In other words, it's a good thing for a parent to work hard and to be diligent and to be a good steward with what God gives you so that you can help your children as they grow. Now, that doesn't mean, listen to me, that doesn't mean that when they get married, you're just doling out money. We've already covered that. But you are to be the provider for your children. Many men have lost the respect of their children because they are no longer actively providing for the needs of their children. Guys, listen. The federal government is not the father. Do you understand that? You, sir, are the father. And it's your responsibility, biblically, to provide for your children and your wife. Then you need to keep your children under control. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 4. The Bible talks about a man of God and that he should not be in certain positions unless he ruleth his own house wisely, that he has control of his house. Folks, listen. We live in a crazy world. We live in a world where children run the house. We live in a world where, therefore, children run the schools and children run many churches. If the kids don't want to come to church, they don't come to church. Guys, can I tell you, I grew up with a very disciplinary man, and being in the house of God was not an option for me, and I thank God in heaven that it was not an option. Don't you, Steve? I thank God that it was not an option. 
Because in my flesh, as a young man, the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. What child? My child, your child, you when you were a child. I may have not been in the house of God had it been optional for me, but I was raised by a man that loved the Lord, and he said, that's not an option. We'll never have to wake up on Sunday morning and wonder what we're going to do. Never have that discussion. We would never on a Saturday night have to sit around the table and wonder what we're going to do tomorrow. We know what we're going to do. We're going to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. We need some men that will not only teach but train their children. But, Dad, let me tell you this. If you are not in the house of God with your children, there will be a time when they will not be in the house of God because they will follow in your footsteps. Now, listen. God wants some men that will provide and that will protect and that will, listen, train their children. And then the Bible says we are to correct them. I'm not going to give you a, a I'm not going to get onto that much. But in Proverbs, if you'll just open the Proverbs and look at what the Bible says is a father's responsibility when it comes to correcting their children. Folks, listen, I'm grateful. I've got 10 grandchildren. And I'm so grateful to God that, that my son and my daughter, when our grandchildren are with us, we have full permission to train them, to teach them, to correct them by whatever means the Lord gives us. Now, that's not always true. I, I, I know young people who will not let their parents watch their grandchildren. They won't, won't allow it. Matter of fact, we had a family just the other day. They were heartbroken. Heartbroken because they had been watching one of the grandchildren, and the child is old enough to understand right from wrong. And the grandmother did a little spat and said, No, don't touch that. Told the mother about it, and the mother said, That's it. Won't leave them with you anymore. This just happened two weeks ago. We'll not leave our children with you anymore. How dare you slap one of my children on the hand? Man, there was days I was growing up, I'd have thanked God for a slap on the hand. <laughs> I, some of you go, preacher, are you, are you, listen, heartbroken family come to our house and shared that with us. We need some men that will biblically, Train and correct children. I say biblically. Never. Listen, never try to correct your children when you're angry. Don't do that. Because then instead of correcting and teaching, it just becomes punishment. You'll never find in the Bible where God says punish your children. No, it never says punish. It says that we are to train them, teach them, and correct them, and discipline them. Listen, when... When Clay was growing up, and I had to spank him once in a while, every day, and uh, <laughs> it was never to punish him. It was because I wanted him to learn something. It was always a correcting in such a manner that it was training him in righteousness. Do you understand the difference? God needs some men that will open the book and do it God's way. Now... It's five minutes after 12, and now I'm ready to preach the message that the Lord laid on my heart this morning. Will y'all give me a few more minutes? Some of you say, my wife left food cooking. Well done ain't bad. Matter of fact, I can't wait to hear the Lord say, well done. <laughs> so it'll just be well done today. I want you to go back with me. To Genesis chapter 31. Genesis 31. And I'm going to tell the story as quickly as I can, and I'll not read all the scriptures. I hope that this stirs your curiosity. Just stirs your curiosity. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 31 that the Lord told Jacob, Verse 3, to return to the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred 
and I will be with you. There had some strife arisen between Jacob and his family and his father-in-law. There was some strife had, had come up. And, and the Bible says that because of that, that God told him to go back to the land of his fathers. And I believe if you'll do a study on this, and the next, I'll, I'll direct you to some of this in just a bit. But he actually told him, as a matter of fact, if you'll drop all the way over to verse number 13 in chapter 31, he said, I'm the God of Bethel. Now look carefully. Where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowest to vow unto me, now arise, get thee out of this land and return into the land of thy kindred. He had just talked about Bethel. So he was telling Jacob to take your family and go back to the land of your fathers, go to Bethel. Now, the Bible says that that journey began, but something happened. He came up just short. That was the name of the message, remember? Just short. He didn't come up short of Bethel because of any physical issue, though he had been in a wrestling match with the Lord. The Bible says that near where God had told him to go, very near where God told him to go, he stopped. How many of you know that God has a specific and a perfect will for your life? Say amen. You, you dads, listen. You fathers, you husbands, and those young men that one day will be. God has a very specific and a very personal will for your life. And yet many men stop just short. Just short of, just short of that next step that will... That will, that will put me not on a journey to the will of God, but that next step that will literally put me in the presence of God and in the will of God, His perfect will for my life. Now, I'm not saying that God's will for us is not progressive. I, do, I believe it does change. I believe in my own life that God called me first to be a, a, a Christian, and he called me to study the Scripture, and then he, he allowed me to teach a Bible class, and then I was ordained as a deacon, and then God blessed me with being able to preach the Word of God. And I believe those things were progressive. I'm not saying that God's will doesn't change. All I'm saying is this. Many men stop just short of God's perfect will for your life. You bail out. Some of you young men, you think because you're 20 years old or 21 years old that somehow you're going to be left behind and th that, that, that one woman that God has planned just for you, you're not willing to wait and you'll stop just short of where God wanted you to be and you'll settle for second best. Are you young men listening to me? And I might as well say since Mother's Day has passed, you young ladies are the same way. Just short of where God's perfect will is, you'll stop and settle for something less than God's specific and perfect will for your life. Do you know what that shows? That shows that you do not really trust God. That shows that you believe that you are wiser than God. That shows that you've allowed your, your flesh, if you will, to take precedent over the Spirit of God that lives in you and the God of heaven that loved you and gave his life for you. Just short. Well, what about Jacob? Well, he stopped just short. As a matter of fact, let me just show you this particular passage. If you'll look there in chapter 33 and verse 17. Now, I'm keeping up with the time, so y'all just stay with me. I'm not paying any attention to it, but I am keeping up with it. The Bible says in verse 17 of Genesis 33, And Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of that place is called Sukkoth. 
And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of, uh, of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Eloah Israel. Now you might say, boy, that sounds like a good thing. No, he stopped short of Bethel. Get your maps. When you get home, get your Bible maps, and you'll find that he stopped just short of where God told him to go. Not far, maybe a few miles, but he stopped just short of God's direction, God's will for his life. You might say, well, so what's the big deal about that? Chapter 34 records what's the big deal about that. The Bible says, In Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Uh-oh! She did what? She went out to see the daughters of the land of Shechem. Do you know that that was evil? The daughters of the land of Shechem were not the kind of women that a young man would want to take to be his wife. But Dinah, Jacob's daughter, having had her dad to build their house just short of where they were supposed to be, but in clear sight of Shechem, she looked out her window and she saw the girls down at Shechem having a great time. Are y'all following me along? Maybe even Jacob woke up of a morning and set his family down around the breakfast table and opened the word of God to them. But, but Dinah could turn and look out the window and just right over there, just, just right over there, she could see the daughters of Shechem, the women of Shechem. And they were having fun. When it was lights out at Dad's house, you see, Jacob... He, he, it wasn't like he was openly rebelling against God. He just stopped short of where God told him to go. When it was lights out at Jacob's house, Dinah would glance out the window and the girls over in Shechem were partying. The girls over in Shechem had boyfriends. They were living the life. The Bible says that Dinah started going to Shechem. She got over in Shechem and she met a guy. I believe probably when they first met, it kind of seemed like it might be the right thing, the right deal, but the Bible says that he defiled her. Re read the book. It's what it says. He defiled her. You might say, well, that wasn't her fault. Now, I'm getting ready to make a statement here that could get me in deep trouble with all female kind. While it is never justified for a man to take advantage of a woman. Are y'all following me? Listen, some of you macho men, some of you guys that you lose your temper, and when you lose your temper, you think it's all right for you to abuse your wife mentally, emotionally, or physically. You'll stand before a holy God and give an answer for that. It is never right for a man to abuse a woman. Never. So I'm not taking up for the fellow over in Shechem. I'm simply saying this. Had Jacob not stopped short, Dinah wouldn't have seen what was going on in Shechem. And if Dinah hadn't uh, saw and liked what she saw, she wouldn't have traveled on down to Shechem, but she did. And I believe when you read the story that what's implied there, not stated but implied, is that she wanted to look like the girls at Shechem. She changed her clothing. She, she didn't dress the way Dad would have chosen for her to dress because now she may have left the house with the clothes on that Dad wanted her to wear, but she changed her clothes when he got to Shechem. You know why? Because she wanted to be like the ladies in Shechem. The Bible says that this young man took advantage of her. Now, it says he loved her. 
It's hard for me to understand how a man can love a woman and rape her. Do you know the Bible is rather explicit? I have people say, oh, you shouldn't say that. For Our kids hear that. Let me tell you, the book is pretty plain. He defiled Dinah. You might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because Jacob stopped just short. Just short of where God told him to go. Dinah became a victim of her dad's partial obedience. She became a victim of her dad's partial obedience. And yet she bears responsibility as well. Miss Kristen, if you'll make your way to the piano. It's going to take her a minute to get here, so let me go ahead and finish this. So Dinah's purity was gone. Gave, gave up something that she could never get back. She had no business in Shechem. Even if her father had not stood up and said, even if he had said, don't go, she still had that responsibility. And some of you young men and young women here today, just because your dad hadn't got a collar on you and you're tied to the post if you're a child of God, you need to make the right decisions and not be like Dinah and want to be like the ladies of the land. So the Bible says that Jacob suffered another bad situation because his son saw what they had done to Dinah. And his sons decided that they would take vengeance on the men of Shechem. And I want you to read that story for yourself. I trust that you'll do that. It unfolds there in chapter 34 of Genesis. And so they planned, they plotted. Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, they resorted to stealing, deception, and murder. Jacob's sons. You might say, well, but they were, they were making things right because of what the men of Shechem did to Dinah. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's been a principle from creation till today. And yet Jacob's sons, they stole from the people at Shechem. They deceived the men of Shechem. And they murdered the men of Shechem. Why in the world did all that happen? Because Father, Father Jacob, stopped just short. Some of you are here today and you need to get saved. And you're just one step away. But some of you are going to stop just short of the kingdom of God. We have some fathers here today, you're saved, but you've stopped short. You have stopped short when it comes to loving your wife the way you should and raising your children the way you should. You almost, you're almost there, but you stopped. Let's all stand together. I pray that I do not have to apologize for the time. Do you know that you may never see another Father's Day? You may never see another Father's Day. We live in an urgent time. We need some men that will be what God has called us to be. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. Miss Kristen's going to play. If you're not saved today, I see some people already coming to the altars. What about you? Are you saved today? Are you sure that if you died, that your eternity will be in heaven? You might say, preacher, I, I sure hope so. Listen, we must not base our eternity on what we hope. 
The Bible says, these things I write unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you need to come today and give your life to Jesus? I'll meet you right here. We have men and women that are trained to share Christ with you. Would you step out from where you are right now? Walk down this aisle and give your life to Jesus. Give your life to him. If you're here this morning and you're saved, you're a saved man. You're a dad, you're a husband. But you know that you've stopped just short. Some of you dads, listen, you can recover. You can get back what you've given away, but you have to do it through repentance. And then be the man that God has called you to be. Would you do that? If you need to come, you come. Some are at the altars. There's time for you. and There's room for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of this earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace, you need to come.